Dr. Shashi, are you starting? Uh, sir, uh, I thought you were going to okay. introduce. I can okay. start straight away. Shall I start? No, no. I'll, I'll the, uh, session straight away? No, no. I'll, I'll just uh, few, say a few words. Please, sir. Please. So, uh, good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to all of you to this second uh, masterclass on dermatopathology. It's a very interesting uh, class uh, in the form of quiz, where by you can you know all interact with the moderator and our expert, uh, Dr. Sashi Kiran Atili. So at the outset, I must congratulate and thank Dr. Sashi Kiran Atili for taking such a uh, huge interest in educating all the postgraduates and uh, creating a lot of interest in the field of dermatopathology, which is often neglected in the curriculum of the postgraduates. So I'm really happy that uh, you know this topic has been taken up by you, and uh, you are a very passionate you know teacher. That that I can you know assure you all of you. And the first class that you know uh, was held last month that 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 was a you know big big favorite with the students and many of my students also were very appreciative of this class. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sashi, for doing a wonderful job for all of our members. And it's a an huge and a great opportunity for all of us to learn the dermatopathology right from the basics uh, and, and uh, you know, acquaint ourselves with the common dermatopathological conditions. I also wish to thank our executive committee of IADVL led by Dr. Vijay Jawar and uh, Dr. Devraj, Dinesh Devraj for uh, you know, supporting all our academic uh, programs wholeheartedly and guiding us throughout. Uh, my sincere thanks to uh, Gloderma Pharma for uh, supporting this educational event and other events also for the IADVL. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Yogeshwar and his team. So without taking much of your time, I would uh, you know, uh, wish this uh, class a, a very best uh, uh, of my wishes and uh, happy learning to all of you. Thank you and over to you, Dr. Sashi. Thank you, sir, for the kind, kind words. So without much uh, ado, we'll start the program. So I'll just share my screen. Um, let me see. So everybody can see my screen, PowerPoint. Yes. Can you see my screen? Yes, it is. It is. Okay, yes, right. So we'll go ahead. So yes, um, this today's uh, quiz is the topic is pattern recognition in dermatopathology. Now, last uh, session, whoever has attended, and we posted, I posted a link to the previous session as well. So whoever has attended, uh, they would have uh, known the basis of the what we do as far as uh, we can listen. So this thing do is uh, we are going to uh, look at pattern recognitions. And pattern recognition is something that has been, um, you know, um, propagated by the late uh, Dr. Bernard Ackerman. And most of my talk is based uh, on his book, uh, Histopathological Diagnosis of Inflammatory Skin Diseases. And uh, yeah, he's, he's uh, my guru. And if you not read, that book certainly that is a book to go to. It's a very concise book. In this quiz, so I the rules have been shown. also given uh, the rule uh, the uh, the word document with the rules. So firstly, you need two um, devices if you want to play the quiz properly or nicely. You need a laptop and uh, um, uh, uh, phone, uh, or you can have two different two different uh, devices, two different laptops, an iPad, whatever you want. Because in one um, device you want to watch in Zoom, and the other device you want to, you know, take take the Kahoot questions. That will be easier that way. Once you, if there's a break in internet, and if you miss a question, you can't go back. Unfortunately, now please make sure you put your full name, including your surname, because otherwise we can't identify you if you win the quiz. And uh, yes, if you win the quiz, A, you'll be given a free registration at the annual Dermatopathology Society of uh, India meeting. And you'll be given a uh, gift of two books, which uh, we'll show you at the end. One is a dermatopathology book and one is a 
clinical uh, dermatology book. Okay. Now, uh, the time for each question is based on the difficulty of the question. And uh, yeah, once you attempt, you can't go back. Each question is marked out of 1,000 points. Maximum points are scored for the fastest correct answer. Okay. So the question, if, if it's allotted 20 seconds, if you answer within five seconds, you'll be scoring more. If you answer at the end, you'll be scoring less. If you get two plus answers, 500 points, say if you answer three, point, three questions in a row uh, continuously, then you get 300 points extra. You'll, you'll know this as we go along. Wrong answer or not attempting gets you zero points, no negative marking. So if you want to take a guess, take it quickly. Uh, uh, you've got nothing to lose. Okay. So uh, the Kahoot um, uh, pin and the link have been posted in the chat box. People who have joined late are going to post it again shortly. And I'll be showing you the Kahoot uh, pin again later on in a second, but I request the technical team to keep posting the uh, pin and the link to join directly in the chat box so that latecomers can join. So steps for evaluating a slide, we discussed uh, evaluating, evaluating in low power and then in high power. In the low power, we look at the site of biopsy, type of inflammatory cells, distribution of inflammation, tissue reaction type, make a provision diagnosis and evaluate in higher power. So this session, I'll be concentrating on discussing the distribution, making a diagnosis based on the distribution of information, inflammation and the tissue reaction patterns. So now is a recap. Question one is a recap for a question based on a recap on the previous sessions. So um, just one second, actually, I'll have to reshare my screen because previously I only shared um, the PowerPoint, I think now I have to share the entire screen. Just give me a second. I can share multiple windows. Um, just a second. Share two. Okay. Is my screen now visible? The uh, can somebody please yes, yes, yes. see the visible. Visible, visible. The game. Uh, okay. screen is visible, so sir, but is, your connection uh, is unstable. Sorry to interrupt, Sarah. Your right. connection might be unstable. You just check. Okay. And you, your screen is visible. You're able to hear me, right? You're able to hear me. Yeah, yeah. Now, now we can. That's fine. That's fine. The okay. voice is breaking. So, the so the game... Is the voice breaking? Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's some problem with your connection. Okay. Is it... Uh, there is a problem with my connection. Okay. I seem to be connected fine, but uh, hopefully it will settle by itself. Let me see. If not, I'll have to log in through no, a different no, computer no, it's a small okay. way. No, but... no, it's okay. Okay. Let me know if it becomes a significant issue. Then I'll yes. log in to a different uh, PC. I'm sure. logged into a Wi Fi, but I'll go into a LAN connection later on if, if that's the case. Okay. So, um, so this is the game pin. So whoever is, there's still some people joining. So I'll give it to two more, two more minutes so that others can also join in. There's some more people joining in. So I'll probably wait for two more minutes. So you can log in either by through kahoot.it or if you download the Kahoot app, once you download the Kahoot app, it will ask for the game pin, which you can enter there. Please write down your full names. Because otherwise we won't be able to, I'm able to identify you if you won the quiz. Somebody's name is Stegard here, which is interesting. Okay, 67. Once it touches 75, probably I'll start because it's already 8. I'll give it till 8, 10. It's 8, 9. One more minute. People who are going out and again joining, so number is fluctuating. Probably I will start people who have joined late uh, because otherwise we'll be going on till, uh, yeah, we'll have to extend the quiz or the time otherwise. Okay, I'm going to start now. So the first question is, um, I'm going to go back to the quiz. So question one, which of the following diseases are not usually associated with this pattern of inflammation? I'm going to show you a photograph, so don't worry. 
which of the following diseases are not usually associated with this pattern of inflammation? And choose only one answer unless specified. I'm not going to repeat this message again. In some answers, you have to choose multiple questions, which I'll mention, but otherwise you just have to choose one answer. So uh, the options are psoriasis, contact dermatitis, lichen planus, and granuloma and villagri. This is from the previous uh, quiz. So this is the pattern of inflammation, and I'm, don't look at the epidermis because the pattern of inflammation is really looking at the vasculature and the inflammation within the vasculature. So this particular type of inflammation around the vasculature can be seen in which of the following diseases except that is the question. So we'll start the quiz right now. Right, so here, uh, which of the following disease is not usually associated with this pattern of inflammation? Yeah, right. okay. So the correct answer is granuloma annulare. Um, 25 of you got it right. I'll tell you why it's granuloma annulare, but uh, let us just look at the leaderboard who got it right. So the quickest to answer is Srividya, Paul, Shrestha, and Adreyo. Okay, so well done, you all. So let us go back to the PowerPoint. So this pattern of inflammation is showing lymphocytes around the superficial blood vessels in the upper dermis. Okay, now I discussed last time that, oops, sorry. So superficial perivascular inflammation is usually associated with epidermal inflammatory diseases, okay? So of the options I gave you, all of these uh, except granuloma annulare or epidermal inflammatory diseases. So by a pattern of exclusion, your diagnosis was granuloma annulare, which is a dermal inflammation, okay? So the answer is psoriasis, contact dermatitis, like inflammation, all epidermal diseases. So the inflammation will be superficial. In GA, the inflammation will be much more deeper, okay? So it's a clear cut answer. The answer is, uh, uh, GA, and that's the correct answer. Okay, now we've got question two as well. So question two is directly going to the diagnosis. Okay, and here are the options. Now, obviously, this is not a diagnosis of this particular. I have another photograph to follow. So uh, I should put uh, options. So you have to choose between glucocytoclastic vasculitis, erythema analyze centrifugum, Lupus erythematosus and viral design. Okay. And this is your photograph. I'll give you two seconds to digest this. Okay. So look at the photograph. I've discussed this in the last session. So this is just a revision session. Um, can you please post Kahoot uh, thing in the uh, in the chat box and for people who are joining late? Um, so please post the Kahoot um, link again. Okay. So you've seen the photograph. I'm going to the Kahoot app to start the sheet. So what's the diagnosis? Glucocytoclastic vasculitis, lipoma analyzed centrifugal, glucocytomatosis, or viral exam. Excellent. Most of you got it right. The answer is glucocytoclastic vasculitis. I'll explain in that in a second. Let's see what the leaderboard is looking like. Excellent. Srividya is still on the top, followed by Atreya. Right. So why is this leukocytoclastic vasculitis? You see here, these are tiny dots. This is leukocytoclasis. This is nuclear dust. And uh, you're seeing a superficial and deep infiltrate. So I discussed superficial and deep inflammation. Apart from distribution of inflammation can be either superficial or superficial and deep. And in superficial and deep, we've got vasculitis pattern. And the vasculitis pattern, you see neutrophils and nuclear dust, okay? So of the disease we discussed, leukocytoclastic is the one that has a vasculitis pattern. The one that has got a vasculitis pattern looks like this. These are lymphocytes, which you see round clear cells with nuclear dust. This is a photograph showing just the non-vasculitic superficial and deep inflammation like in the slide I show you just now is seen in lupus, viral examples, erythema analyzed, centrifugal, etc. All right. So um, 
then you have uh, much more uh, you know denser infiltrates and these can be seen this is called perivascular nodular seen in granulomatous and lymphomatous disorders now moving on to question three now now this is all revision just a few slides to revise and then we'll go on to um, the pattern based diagnosis of a bit more depth so which of the following diseases does not usually show this pattern and here are your options lymphoma Jessner's lymphocytic infiltrate sweet syndrome and lepromatous leprosy so does not show this pattern of the four diseases that i've discussed here which this pattern and this is the pattern okay the pattern you can filter okay so i'll give you two seconds to digest this photograph but you've already seen this in the previous lecture and so let us go on to the quiz which of the following does not show this pattern Right. So I'm surprised actually. The question was does not show this pattern, not shows this pattern. So this is a diffuse infiltrate. Lepromatous leprosy, which uh, quite a few have chosen, does show a diffuse infiltrate, doesn't it? It has a diffuse infiltrate of foamy lymphocytes. So I don't know why you chose that. Sweets can have a diffuse infiltrate. Lymphoma can have a diffuse infiltrate. Jessner's, like lupus, has a perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate in the superficial and deep dermis. So Jessner's is the correct answer. But uh, let's see what the leaderboard is looking like now. Srividya has gone down. Nadia Shirazi is now on top, followed by Avi Sajjane and then Abhita. Excellent. Avi Sajjane is on a streak with three current answers in low. Okay, so this leaderboard is dynamic and change to different Hansons. Okay, we've discussed that in the last lecture already. Okay. Um, so distribution of inflammation, we've discussed superficial perivascular, superficial deep, perivascular and diffuse. Then we have either paniculitis and then we have a perifolliculitis or a folliculitis. Okay, so now we go on to the tissue reaction patterns or types. There are six basic tissue reaction patterns that have been described traditionally. One is lichenoid, that is sorazepam, spongiotic, vesiculobulus, granulomatous and vasculopathic, obviously. I cannot discuss all of these in great detail. I'm going to only discuss the prototype and then we'll discuss each of these reaction patterns in detail in the subsequent uh, sessions. So question four coming to you, which reaction pattern is demonstrated in the following slide? Now I expect you to make some uh, basic uh, diagnosis based on reaction pattern because this, uh, you should know some basics. So we'll see, see what we know and then take it from there. So the option that is spongiotic, sorazicform, lichenoid, or all the above. Sometimes you can have a mixture of reaction patterns. And this is your photograph here. I'll give you two seconds to digest this. So go by the predominant pattern. Don't, uh, you, you do, it's not multiple choice. Go by the predominant, or if you think all of the patterns are there, you can choose all of the above. Spongiotic, sorazicform, or lichenoid. Okay, we'll go on to the quiz right now. So question four of, 20 questions are there. Excellent. This is a surrounding form pattern. Some of you have chosen all the above. Uh, I'll discuss why it is not. And some of you have chosen spongiotic. Some amount of spongiosis is there, but it is not a spongiotic pattern. You have to choose the predominant pattern, as I told you. Now, for those of you who have joined late and want to still join the quiz, this is the Kahoot pin that is visible all the time in the Kahoot screen. So if you want to still join, you can join. Obviously, you may get lesser points, but it's still fun to join the quiz and take the quiz. So don't be disheartened if you've joined later. So um, let's see what the leaderboard is looking like. So Atulia has gone to top, Srividya has come back, and Atreyo is also back at number three. Four players have just dropped their answer streak of three with this question. Okay, so this is a sorazifirm reaction pattern. Why is it a sorazifirm reaction pattern? You see elongated retiages, which are bulbous at the tips, 
which are clubbed. You can see these two criteria just joining together. This is called clubbing. Okay. And what you're also seeing is suprapapillary plate thinning. You can see that to some extent here. You're seeing parakeratosis, which is usually confluent, dilated capillaries in the papillary dermis. Some of them are going up to the subcorneal layer. These are neutrophils. The sorry, the inflammatory cells are going to the subcorneal layer. These are neutrophils. So you have subcorneal neutrophils, parakeratosis. Some amount of compact hyperkeratosis will also be present. You have com parakeratosis, compact hyperkeratosis, psoriasiform acanthosis. So what do I actually mean by psoriasiform acanthosis? It is means regular epidermal hyperplasia. So this is an example of low power showing a better example, actually. This is called psoriasiform, so very regular, elongated retiridges with clubbing. So such a regular pattern of psoriasiform acanthosis is usually typical of psoriasis, though a psoriasiform pattern can be seen in a number of other diseases, okay? Um, so question five, we are moving on now. Um, so what is question five? What is the last name or the surname of the person after whom the sign is named? So you have to type your answer here. You've been given 30 seconds. Type in all small case, please. It's only a single word answer. Okay. You have to type the last name. Everybody knows the last name. It's not a trick question. The sign is known by the last name of the person or the surname of the person. So it's not a trick question. Even I don't know the first name until I looked it up. Okay. So the sign is here. So and I'm pointing to it, that's the arrow, okay? So I want the name of the person after which the sign is named, okay? And uh, your question starts in a few seconds. Please type your answers, all small bit. Two people who have uh, answered. So, um, right. So, the correct answers are it's actually Kogoj, but I've given you an answer if you mean you said Kagoj. Uh, so, you've got variable, various answers, I think. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you've got Monroe's abscesses. Monroe's abscesses, subcornial abscesses, okay. Pottery abscesses are seen usually in mycosis fungoides. So, these are neutrophils which are present forming a small pustules. These are spongiform pustules of Kogoch. Spongiform means there is spongiosis and the pustules are neutrophils, okay? So auspid sign is the clinical sign. It's not a histological sign. Um, none of these actually, some of them, some of you have written your name for some reason. Um, right, okay. So these are spongiform pustules of Kogoch, okay? So let's see what the leaderboard is like. Okay, can I see? And next. Let's see who's leading now. Chandana Shajil is now on top, followed by Atulia and then Sri Vijaya. Up 18 places, Sarat Sri is the highest climber. Excellent. Well done. So you've still got a long way to go. We've only finished five questions, I think. So histopathology of psoriasis or psoriasiform dermatosis actually is characterized by parakeratosis. Neutrophilic subcornic pustules are typical of psoriasis. They're not being seen in all psoriasiform disorders. Hypogranulosis is important. Why does hypogranulosis happen in psoriasis? Now in psoriasis, what happens is this. There's um, extensive or accelerated proliferation of the epidermis, okay? So when the epidermis is multiply is multiplying when the epidermal keratinocytes are rapidly multiplying, there is not uh, enough time for the granular layer to form. So hence there is hypogranulosis. Okay. So there's not enough layer, time for the granular layer to form. And that is the reason you have hypogranulosis in psoriasis. And when there is not enough time for the granular layer to form, the nuclei reta are retained and that's why you have parakeratosis. So that's the reason you have both parakeratosis and hypogranulosis. So often hypogranulosis and parakeratosis both go together. And that is an important point in the pathogenesis to understand, okay? And regular acanthosis with suprapapillary thinning of stratum malfigi, bulbous thickening of the retigages 
irregular dilated tortuous blood vessels, the dermal papillae, clubbing, I've all discussed this, okay? So this is your histology. And uh, hopefully now you can make a definite diagnosis of psoriasis when you see one. Question six, which of the following is associated with a psoriasis form pattern? And now you have to select all the correct answers, okay? There's no, there's no picture here. So lichen simplex chronicus, pityriasis rupa pilaris, ilven, and clear cell acanthoma. So your quiz starts now. You have to select multiple options. Okay, which of the following is associated with the psoriasiform pattern? Mark all the correct answers. Okay, so the correct answer is actually all. All of them have a psoriasiform pattern. Lichen simplex chronicus, though it's a spongiotic dermatitis to start with, eventually assumes a psoriasiform pattern, okay, where there is acanthosis, elongation of reti ridges. So often, sometimes, a lichen simplex chronicus, unless you're seeing subcorneal pustules and you're seeing, uh, you know, dilated, uh, you know, other features, parakeratosis. Other features, it's difficult to differentiate sometimes, like in simplex chronicus, but I'll discuss that in a second. What features of like in simplex chronicus allow us to differentiate it from psoriasis, but it comes under a psoriasiform pattern. Pityriasis, rubia pilaris, we all know, it resembles psoriasis. Ilven, we all know, resembles psoriasis. Clear cell acanthoma is a very important differential. So if you have a single lesion, okay, a small papule or something, you biopsy it, see a typical histological picture of psoriasis, it's not psoriasis. And often you can see clear cells within the epidermis. This is the clear cell acanthoma has a psoriasiform pattern. So the answer is all of the above. If you've answered one, you get 25% marks. If you answer two, you get 50%. So that's how this works. I think this question is marked out of 2,000 points. So let's see where everybody is. So Chandana Sajal is still at the top, followed by Srividya and Atre Yogi. We've only got a very consistent uh, pattern of names here. Up 18 places, Prachi G is the highest climber. So all of you, all of the rest, you still have time. So do keep answering. Question seven. I think we're still uh, sticking to this pattern. Which of the following is not associated with the psoriasiform pattern? Okay. Now select all correct answers again. Okay. Which of the following is not sorry? Uh, uh, sorry. This uh, the the question is you have to select only one answer. Sorry. The the uh, it's written wrongly there. Only select one answer. Which of the following is not associated with psoriasiform pattern? There's only one correct answer. Please select only one when you get to the Kahoot options. So the options are Bowen's disease, Reiter's syndrome, mycosis fungoidus, and discoid lupus. Your, your question starts now. Only select one answer. Not associated with the psoriasiform pattern. <laughs> Excellent. Most of you have got it right because you all know DLA has got a lichenoid pattern. Bowens will have a psoriasiform pattern, and it's an important uh, you know, to understand that psoriasiform pattern doesn't mean always inflammatory. I told you clear cell acanthoma also has, uh, you know. A psoriasis like pattern. So this basis the the reason I put this all is to educate you at the same time to understand what your baseline knowledge is. So somebody who already knows the answer by a manner of it, or if you don't know the answer, you can at least choose the answer by a manner of exclusion. That's how MCQs work in exams, right? So Bowen's disease can have psoriasiform pattern. Mycosis fungoides not necessarily has a psoriasiform pattern, but can have a psoriasiform pattern. And Reiter's syndrome often has a psoriasiform pattern. DLE is one that has a lichenoid pattern, usually has atrophy rather than psoriasiform acanthosis. And let's see what the leaderboard is like. Still the top two remain the same, followed by Vikas and Yaz. Four players have reached an answer streak of four. Excellent. So let's go on to the next part. So psoriasiform reaction pattern can be seen in a number of conditions. I have put up a screenshot of uh, what uh, Whedon's book describes. I'm not going to go into the details right now. 
but uh, we'll do that in one of the subsequent sessions where I'll discuss in details rasiform disorders. Okay, so now moving on to the next reaction pattern, which is spongiotic reaction pattern. What does a spongiotic reaction pattern mean? You have intraepidermal, intercellular edema. Okay, so if you have intracellular edema, that can be there as well, but that is not the definition of spongiosis. Spongiosis implies intercellular edema. So here are the keratinocytes. Between the keratinocytes, you see these spaces. Okay, this is spongiosis. This is intercellular edema. So sometimes you have intracellular edema, which is ballooning degeneration. You can see that even in herpes, herpetic lesions. That is not necessarily spongiosis. Spongiosis implies intercellular edema. So in spongiotic disorders, often you see acanthosis, but that depends on the duration of the lesions. The longer the duration of the lesion, the more the lesion is scratched, the more there is acanthosis. Often you see parakeratosis. So similar to psoriasis, there is accelerated epidermal turnover even in spongiotic disorders. And it's an acute process. Therefore, there is hypogranulosis again. So hypogranulosis is not restricted to psoriasis can be seen also in spongiotic disorders. Similarly, parakeratosis is also present. But in addition to parakeratosis, what is also present is this pink stuff. This pink stuff is what we call serum crust, which is what is visible as oozing in spongiotic disorders. Okay, This oozing is called serum crust you know, histopathologically, and that's visible as this pink stuff. Okay, You may or may not see neutrophils. Any acute inflammation, you may have neutrophils. So just because you may be seeing one or two neutrophils here, it is not psoriasis. So not all subconium neutrophils psoriasis. They may be secondary impetigo. There are other reasons for subconium neutrophils. But essentially, this amount of spongiosis, this is primarily a spongiotic disorder. This is not psoriasiform pattern. Why? Because there is no regular elongation of retinages. Yes, there is acanthosis. And when there is acanthosis, you may have elongated retinages. But these are not elongated in the psoriasiform pattern sense. These are thick. And you see the, the retinages are quite thick. They're not bulbous at the tip. In fact, they go bulbous at the top and thinned out at the bottom. Can you make out the pattern difference? Though there may be focal clubbing here. Okay? So you may call this clubbing when the retinages are elongated, they may fuse together, but there is no bulbous uh, enlargement of the tips. And that is a differentiating feature. Of course, the spongiotic pattern itself should give you the clue. This amount of marked spongiosis is not usually seen in psoriasis. If at all you're seeing uh, spongiosis, it will be focal, as we saw in the previous picture. What is also obvious in psoriasis are these lymphocytes within the epidermis. Can you see these round blue structures? These are nuclei of the lymphocytes. Okay, this is called lymphocyte exocytosis. Uh, this is epiderm, sorry, this is called lymphocyte exocytosis. This is in contrast to epidermotropism, which we may see in mycosis fungoides. Okay. So these are, this is lymphocyte exocytosis. This round, dark blue nuclei are lymphocytes. These are keratinocytes separated from each other by the space. And these are desmosomes that are stretched apart. These ladder-like uh, bridges are desmosomes that you can nicely see in spongiotic disorders. This is again a close-up. See how beautiful it is. You can see these ladder-like um, you know, attachments between keratinocytes. This is a keratinocyte nucleus what is called an epithelioid cell, keratinocyte nucleus with uh, desmosomes attaching each of the keratinocytes, okay? And a lymphocyte here as well. So sometimes the uh, intercellular edema becomes so much, you may see even spongiotic vesicles, okay? So this is a spongiotic pattern. In acute spongiotic dermatitis, you see spongiosis, paracaratosis, serum crust, exocyte of lymphocytes, Spongiotic vesicles and depending on the duration of regions, you may see acanthosis. Okay. Now, uh, by the way, if you have any questions, please post them in the chat box. I'll try them. I'll try and answer them later on at the end of the session. I'm not looking at the chat box right now. So as inflammation progresses, it becomes chronic. This is an example of lichen simplex chronicus. This is chronic spongiotic dermatitis. Now, in the subacute phase, you see a mixture of these. So if you're seeing this features along with some amount of acute spongiotic features. We call it a subacute spongiotic dermatitis. This is a chronic eczema where the lesion has been scratched. You see a psoriasiform pattern. You see there elongated retigages, which look more, like, more or less regular, but there is no bulbous elongation of the retigages at the tips. Okay, the unlike psoriasis, this is not seen uh, in this pattern. 
But what you're seeing is here is a vertical alignment of collagen fibers from repeated scratching. There is some amount of papillary dermal fibrosis. And this papillary dermal fibrosis is manifested as these, as these collagen fibers, which become vertically elongated and go into the papillary dermis. So this is a typical feature. Also, you see some amount of hypergranulosis, particularly where the dells are, okay? So where you have the bulbous retiridges, there you have thickening of the, you have acanthosis. When there is acanthosis here, you have hypergranulosis because the slow process has become chronic. There is enough time for the granular layer to form. In the acute phase, there's not enough layer, time for the granular layer to form. Hence, you also see parakeratosis there. Here in the chronic phase, parakeratosis is not that obvious and hypergranulosis becomes more prominent. You see the pathology here. Once you understand the pathology, you'll, able, you'll be able to understand everything. So in psoriasiform pattern in psoriasis, even though it's chronic, the epidermal turnover is still high, even in chronic psoriasis. There you won't see hypergranulosis. It's not possible to see hypergranulosis in psoriasis. So in seeing a psoriasiform pattern, seeing hypergranulosis, seeing these nice uh, collagen bundles which are going into the papillary dermis, this is Zykin simplex chronicus. Okay. So histology, histopathology of subacute or chronic spongiotic permatitis, variable features of acute spongiosis. You see irregular acanthus, not as regular as psoriasis. Hyperkeratosis, compact and para may be present, variable hypergranulosis, but most importantly, you see this vertical alignment of papillary dermal collagen. Okay. So now what complicates things is spongiosis is not always absolute. Sometimes you see a spongiotic and lipenoid pattern. Sometimes you see a spongiotic psoriasiform pattern, as you may see in inflammatory psoriasis or lichen simplex chronicus. Sometimes you see a spongiotic psoriasiform and lichenoid pattern. Sometimes you see a psoriasiform and lichenoid pattern. Now, these are all patterns that I'll discuss later, but I just to uh, explain. So, spongiotic dermatosis, these are, this is from Ackerman's um, algorithm. I won't go into the detail, but you have different variants, lichenoid, psoriasiform, lichenoid, purely spongiotic, which you can see in seborrheic dermatitis, contact dermatitis, etc. Okay. So coming on to the next basic tissue reaction pattern, which is a lichenoid pattern. What does lichenoid pattern imply? Essentially, you should see basal cell damage and interface dermatitis. Unless you see this, you don't call this the lichenoid pattern. So this is a typical classical example of lichenoid pattern, which is lichen planus. What do you see in lichen planus? You see nice hypergranulosis, hyperkeratosis, acanthosis or atrophy may be seen depending on the duration of the lesion. Sometimes in atrophic lichen planus, you may see atrophy, but usually in lichen planus, you see uh, acanthosis and hypertrophy of the epidermis. What is typical is that the lymphocytes eat away into the epidermis, causing this sawtoothing, okay? So this is what's called sawtoothing of the epidermis, epidermal uh, epidermis with the basement membrane completely lost. There's no basement membrane here. It's lost. The basal layer is lost. In fact, you see this vacuoles. You see these small vacuoles here. Vacuoles, which these are civat cells. These are colloid bodies. This pink stuff is colloid bodies, okay? So these are degenerate apoptotic keratinocytes called um, civat bodies or, and, and the cells are called civat cells. Once it drop down to the um, papillary dermis, we call them civat bodies, but the terms are often used interchangeably. You see a band-like lymphocytic infiltrate. You see melophages, lymphocytes. This is typical of lichen planus, okay? This is a high power view showing the nice colloid bodies. You won't see them any better than this picture. Often, if you're relying purely on colloid bodies though to make a diagnosis, you may not get the diagnosis. So colloid bodies, if you're seeing them, it's beautiful, but we often rely on the other features rather than purely on colloid bodies. But yes, apoptotic keratinocytes do need to be seen. We do, we do need to see vacuolar interface change. Okay. So histopathology of lichen planus, epidermal echinthos or atrophy, hypergranulosis, band-like lymphocytic infiltrate, as you all know, sawtooth retiages, vacuolar base membrane degeneration, and malophages. So interface dermatosis, I'd like to use the term interface dermatosis rather than lichenoid dermatosis because interface dermatosis means the entire interface is involved, whether it's a vacular type or lichenoid type. Lichenoid usually refers to a band-like lymphocytic infiltrate, which may be hugging the epidermal base membrane as in lichen planus or obscuring the derma-epidermal junction. I'll show you pictures to demonstrate this in a second. 
And then you have the vacular type of interface dermatosis where there's much less inflammation. So the essential difference between lichenoid and vacular is purely the amount of inflammation. If the inflammation is dense band-like, it's called lichenoid. If the inflammation is very sparse and you're only seeing vacular interface change without much of inflammatory infiltrates, it's called vacular interface dermatitis. But these are often overlapping entities depending on the stage of inflammation, depending on whether the lesion has been treated or not. Even in lichen planus, you may just see a vacular interface change. For example, in lichen planus pigmentosis, often you see just vacular interface change. So uh, vacular, but these are the prototypes of vacular and lichenoid dermatitis. Now, for those of you who want to read about it in greater details, please refer to this, um, um, you know, publication of mine in the IJ, in the, inter in the Indian Journal of Dermatopathology. Uh, the reference is here, Interface Dermatosis Revisited. Feel free to browse through that. Question eight, what is the reaction pattern seen here? Is it, so I'm going to post a picture right now. Is it seraziform, spongiotic, lichenoid, or a combination of one and two? Here's your picture. The two pictures here, so don't be uh, in a hurry yet. I'm not, I'm not giving you the quiz yet. So is it seraziform, lichenoid, spongiotic, or a combination of seraziform and spongiotic? So second image is here, okay? So this is the first image here. I'll explain the slide once we go through the quiz. This is the second image. Okay, now let's move on to the quiz. So is it seraziform, spongiotic, lichen? Excellent. Most of you have got it right. It's uh, lichenoid. Uh, it's not so as if um, there is some amount of spongiosis. We had even said spongiosis out of uh, it would have been partly right, but it is definitely not um, so as if um, let's see who's leading. So Chandana, Sajir, Sri Vidya, and Vikas. So three ago, Avita is back in the game apparently. So anyway, well done all for uh, if you've got the correct answer. So this uh, actually is an example of pityriasis lichenoidis, where you see, often you see confluent parakeratosis. This is obscuring, interface obscuring interface dermatitis, okay? So you see here, the interface is obscured. You can't see the basement membrane, lots of vacuoles. But here in lichen, uh, in pityriasis lichenoidis, the difference is that the apoptotic cells extend up to the higher epidermis. So normally apoptotic keratinocytes, this is a CIVAT cell, Apoptotic keratinocytes in lichen planus are restricted to the basement membrane zone. Here, this apoptotic keratinocyte is present higher up. So these are called high apoptotic keratinocytes. Okay. Now, once you're seeing apoptotic keratinocytes, it is a lichenoid interface dermatitis. You can be sure about it. Or interface dermatitis. Okay. So lots of lymphocytes, interface dermatitis, lots of vacuoles. So it is definitely interface dermatitis. You're seeing melanophages. Hypergranulosis may or may not be present, and it's not a feature of pityriasis lichenoidis. Often you see hypergranulosis because often you see some amount of spongiosis, exocytosis of lymphocytes, high apoptotic keratinocytes, parakeratosis is often seen. So, and usually a wedge shaped dermal infiltrate of lymphocytes. So, this is typical of pityriasis lichenoidis. I don't like to differentiate acute and chronic because that depends on the um, stage of the lesion biopsy. So even in pityriasis lichenoidis chronica, so-called, if you biopsy a recent lesion, you may see acute changes. So histopathologically, I do not like to make a distinction between acute and chronica. Um, I can say the information is dense or less dense. Question nine, by the way, let's move on to that and we'll discuss further. Single word to describe this sign. Um, Actually, yeah, um, I think the, yeah, single word to describe this sign, type the answer, all small case, okay? Single word to describe this sign. So you're seeing something here in this slide, and I want a single word to describe this. I'll give you a few more seconds to analyze the slide. Okay, this we are still dealing with the epidermis, by the way. We're not gone very far from the epidermis. I'm still dealing with pattern reactions. Okay, 
So I want one uh, sign to describe the particular changes in the epidermis that we are seeing here, right in the middle. Don't go into the periphery, right in the middle, there are some changes here. What is, what is it that we are seeing? We'll move on to the question now. So be ready to type your answer. Single word. All in all cases. Okay. Excellent. We've got lots of variable answers, but the correct answer is acanthalysis. Okay. Uh, let's see uh, what all answers you've given. So, spongiosis, ballooning, acanthosis, ballooning degeneration, spongiotic, exocytosis. Okay. Uh, right. All of these are unfortunately the wrong answers. Uh, let's see who's leading and then we'll move on to the next. So Chandana Saji, now we've got Dr. Deepali, who's now come onto the leaderboard. Excellent, well done. Then as somebody called SK and Aishwarya. SK, if you don't enter your full name, we won't know who you are. So you better do it if, you, if there's an opportunity now. I don't know if you can. So this is acanthalysis. You see here, the difference between spongiosis and acanthalysis is that in acanthalysis, you don't see desmosomes. Okay, here you're seeing someone with spongiosis, that's okay. But in acanthalysis, the cells become separate from each other completely, okay? So, and they're freely lying. In spongiosis, you don't see that. This is acanthalysis. So this, with this question, we moved on to the next basic tissue reaction pattern, which is the vesiculobullous pattern. I can't obviously discuss each of these patterns in very great detail. I'm only introducing you to each of these patterns and we'll discuss this in greater detail later. So vesiculobullous diseases refers to blistering either within or beneath the epidermis. Uh, question 10 is very interesting because I will ask you now to identify four different, now it's a puzzle actually. You will have to arrange these uh, slides according to order of the depth of the blister. So I'm going to show you four different slides. Each is a blistering disorder, but the depth, the, the level of the blister is different in each of the slides, okay? You've got four slides and you've got to arrange them in your Kahoot app. According to the level of blistering, the superficial one being first, the deepest one being the last, okay? So arrange the following by level of blistering from superficial to deep. Now, this is the first histological picture. Look at these carefully and probably write down what you think is the level of the blister. This is A, okay? So write down what you think is the level of the blister. Look at the slide carefully. I'll give you two seconds. You might want to write this down because the four different slides, you might want to write down what you think is the level of the blister. Okay, so this is A, this is B. Again, write down what you think is the level of the blister so that you can get back to this. Okay, you're not writing it on Kahoot app, you just write it down somewhere on a piece of paper or scribble it in your uh, phone or something. So this is B, identify the level of blister. C, identify the level of blister. I'll discuss each of these once we finish the quiz. But here I'm only asking you to identify the level of the blister. Maybe if you get the diagnosis also based on the slide, you may be able to identify the level of the blister. That is one way. Some of the slides are really diagnostic. You should be able to identify the level of blister based on that also. And then D, okay? Identify the level of the blister, okay? So we've got a, B, C, and D, okay? So you have to now arrange these based on the level of blister, superficial first and the depth, deepest one at the end. So let us go to the quiz. Question 10, we are now halfway. Double points actually for this question. The arranged random order, by the way, this DP is not the right answer. Arranged in random order. On your app, you have to arrange it in the correct order. No good, it's just random here. Okay. 
So 11 of you have got the answer completely right. So the correct order is B, A, D, and C. I'll discuss that in a second. Let's see who got it right. The leaderboard will change significantly now. Aishwarya K is at top. Swati N is the highest climber of 21 places. Sri Vidya has now moved on to fifth. Chandana Saji is second. Kalimi Udhyayani, new name. And Dr. Dipali at number fourth. Well done, guys. Keep answering your dog midway. So what are these entities? Let's go through them one by one, okay? Now I'll go to the first one. First one is actually the blister is the subcorneal level. This is the corneal layer and this is a subcorneal uh, blister. This is actually pemphigus foliaceous. There's not much inflammation in this particular case, but often you tend to see some inflammation within the blister. Here the blister is completely, the roof is taken off completely. So whatever fluid is it has gone off, has sort of washed away during processing. That's why you're not seeing any inflammation here. This is a case of pemphigus foliaceous. The blister level is subcorneal. So B is the first one. Now here, the level of the blister is intraepidermal. You're seeing the basal layer here. So it's not definitely a sub, uh, sub epidermal blister. It is intraepidermal. Okay. But you're seeing some keratinocytes here. It is not just supra basal, it is intraepidermal. This is a case of IgA pemphigus. Where you're seeing intraepidermal blistering with neutrophils actually. Okay. So this is an example of an intraepidermal blister. So B A. Then we've got pemphigus, where you're seeing typical tombstoning of keratinocytes. This is a suprabasal blister. It's intraepidermal, but suprabasal. The level is slightly lower down. Okay. So this is a case of pemphigus. Okay. And then we've got a nice eosinophilic rich blister, which is subepidermal. You can see here. This is the dermoepidermal junction. The blister starts off exactly there. This is a subepidermal blister. You're not seeing any keratinocytes at the base of the blister. Okay, nothing at all. So this is a subepidermal blister rich in eosinophils. This is bullous pemphigoid. Okay, so this is a simple illustration of all the sub of, of the blistering disease in one screenshot. So bullous dermatosis can be divided into subcorneal, intraepidermal, or suprabasal, and then subepidermal. In subcorneal and intraepidermal, we then divide them into acantholytic or non-acantholytic. And we all know the acantholytic disorders, which is the pemphigus group, group of disorders, but you also see them in Haley, Haley, etc. So subcorneal, these are the examples, pemphigus foliaceous, bullous impetigo, staphylococcus called skin syndrome. Intraepidermal, pemphigus vulgaris can also be sometimes intraepidermal. Uh, IgA pemphigus, Darius, pomphilix also. Then you have subepidermal bullous disorders, either cell poor, which is EBA, cell poor, bullous pemphigoid, sometimes erythema multiformic can be cell poor, and uh, cutanea tarda. Then neutrophil rich bullous disorders, lymphocyte rich bullous disorders, and then you have eosinophil rich bullous disorders. I won't go into any great detail in this particular lecture. Question 11 is identify the cell. You'll be given four options. Okay. So the options are. Plasma cell, mast cell, keratinocyte, or histiocyte. And this is your picture. We have discussed identification of cells before. This is, this is like sort of revision. And the cell I'm wanting you to identify is this particular cell here. Okay. And uh, I think if you know the answer, you know the answer. So I'm moving on. If you want, I'll give it two seconds, maybe another two seconds before I move on to the Kahoot app. Okay, Kahoot app. Now, identify the cell. Most of you have got the answer right. This is a typical epithelioid cell. It's a histiocyte. Okay. So let's see how many of you have got the answer. Right. Leaderboard remains unchanged. Excellent. Well done. Up to 11, up 11 places. Sunita M is the highest climber. Okay. So there is another question though, after which I'll discuss. Question 12 is also identify the cell. And this is the here your options. Options are slightly different. Uh, mast cell and histiocyte remain in the options, but then we've got sebocyte and it's not sebocyte, sebocyte and adipocyte. Okay. Sebocyte is a sebaceous cell, adipocyte is a fat cell. And here is the arrow pointing at the cell I wanted to identify, which is this cell here. Okay. 
So let's go on to the Kahoot app. I think if you know, you know this. If you don't know, you don't know. Right. I managed to confuse you guys. I should be proud of myself, but I'm not actually because you should have known this from the previous side of side identification lecture. The first lecture I had showed you this. This is again a histiocyte. This is a foamy histiocyte. I have now moved on to granulomatous disorders. I was trying to show you the two different types of histiocytes. One is an epithelial histiocyte and one is a foamy histiocyte. This does look like a sebocyte slightly. I have to admit there is a confusing factor. I'll tell you why it's not. Uh, so the top, uh, in the top is Aishwarya K, followed by Chandana, Kalimi, Gitanjali, and Dr. Uh, Deepali. Atreyo has now climbed up 11 places, though Atreyo was in the top. So this is a foamy histiocyte, okay? You're seeing lots of lymphocytes here. These are not sebaceous. This is not a sebaceous gland. In sebaceous gland, it has a grand, glandular structure, okay? These cells are not arranged in a glandular. They're not, so sebaceous glands, I'll have to go to the previous lecture. Actually, I've not put a slide of that. And often, you know, se sebaceous inflammation is extremely rare. And I'm trying to tell you, teach you basics. So there are two different types of histiocytes. We'll now move on to the granulomatous lecture. One is the epithelioid histiocyte, which resembles epithelial cells, oval to elongated, uh, slipper shaped vesicular nuclei with prominent nucleoli, eosinophilic cytoplasm. Indistinct cell margins with a tendency to seeming cohesiveness. Okay. So I'll uh, go back to the slide here. Okay. So this is an epithelial histocyte, slipper shaped. Okay. Slipper shaped cell, eosinophilic cytoplasm is the cytoplasm merging with the surrounding cells. You can't say when the cytoplasm of this cell ends and which where this begins. So that's an epithelial histocyte. This is a foamy histocyte with foamy cytoplasm. The nucleus becomes a bit more rounded in a, in a foamy histiocyte. Okay, so this is an example of uh, Lepromatous Hansen's actually. So, what is a granuloma? A granuloma is a relatively discrete collection of histiocytes, usually of the epithelioid type. That is the basic definition of granuloma. Okay, there may or may not be other inflammatory cells, and there may or may not be giant cells. There may or may not be central necrosis, but if they are a collection of histiocytes, usually we call that a granuloma. And this can be very confusing for people who just, you know, entered dermatopathology. Two different types of histiocytes, I've just told you. One is an epithelioid and one is a foamy type. Epithelioid type, prototype is tuberculoid leprosy. And you see these tuberculoid granulomas. The tuberculoid granulomas often have a mantle of lymphocytes here with a collection of epithelioid cells, okay? And this is an example. Foamy non-epithelial histiocytes, histiocytes with foamy cytoplasm, not eosinophilic, lepromatous leprosy, but also seen in lobular panicleitis or a con as a consequence of necros or adipocytes. These adipocytes, when they're taken up by the histiocytes, they assume a, uh, uh, the pattern of a foamy cytoplasm looking like foamy histiocytes. Then xanthomas and xanthogranomas, of course. And this is the picture I showed you earlier. And this is the high, low power view of the same uh, case. This is a high power view showing lepromatous leprosy. And I showed you the diffuse pattern of lepromatous leprosy, right? So four different basic types of granulomas. One is a sarcoidal granuloma with, without much inflammation. These are collection of epithelioid cells with hardly any lymphocytes, with a mantle of lymphocytes, often with langerhans type gain cells. Are, and often you may see central necrosis, but that's not criteria. This is a tuberculoid granuloma. Palisading granuloma, you see here around the central palisade of degenerate uh, material, then you see a separative granuloma, which often has neutrophils. So see the four basic types of granulomas. Okay, now this is a prototype of tube of uh, tuberculoid granuloma. This is a case of I think um, lupus vulgaris. I think not a typical case, uh, but you can see here these are Langham type uh, giant cells, histiocytes, lymphocytes. You can see that there. Okay. Sometimes you may, uh, some of the cytoplasm may assume a foamy appearance in some of the cases, but you're looking at the predominant pattern actually. Predominantly, it's epithelial type of histiocytes. Okay, so tuberculoid granulomas seen in tuberculosis, tuberculates, leprosy, leishmaniasis, rosacea, LMDF, OFG, Crohn's, etc. Then you have the sarcoidal granulomas. Sarcoidal granulomas are usually 
uh, clustered together. So one granuloma, two granulomas, three granulomas, all of these are clumped together, usually in small nodules. Okay, so it assumes a nodular pattern. And they're usually confluent nodules, unlike in tuberculoid Hansen's, where there is, there's no confluence of granulomas, there's confluence of cells. Individual cells become confluent, but the granulomas are often separate from each other. I mean, they, they don't, uh, uh, they, they're not grouped together as bunches here as in sarcoidal granulomas. You can see here sarcoidal granulomas. You do see some lymphocytes, okay, in sarcoidal granulomas too, but unlike uh, uh, in, in sarcoidal granulomas, I told you the granulomas are cohesive. So granulomas are all, they're all grouped together, unlike in tuberculite granulomas. So sarcoidal granulomas can be present in a number of entities, sarcoidosis being the prototype, but there are a number of other entities. You see Crohn's disease also is part of it. Sometimes tuberculin and sarcoid overlap, and that's why you say sarcoidal granulomas cannot be made. The diagnosis of sarcoidosis cannot be made unless you exclude other diseases. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. So here is question number 13, fill in the blanks. It's a two word answer. Remember, type in all small case. What is the diagnosis? I'm going to show you a histological image. Actually, I think there are going to be two histological images. This is one, okay? So you have to make a diagnosis. Diagnosis and type in the answer, okay? So this is one image and this is a second image. This and this. So make a pattern analysis on low power and then look at the higher power image, okay? So one and then two. I think if you know the answer, you know it already. So I'm going to move on to the question. What is the diagnosis? Type your answers, please. Two word answer. Word answer, all small, yes. So, granuloma analogy is the correct answer. Somebody of you, so I any of you have written GA, I've given you the answer, but it is GA actually. Let's see what all answers you're given. So some of you have just given a pattern, lupus vulgaris, borderline leprosy. Okay. So none of these are correct actually. Uh, and I'll tell you why in a second. So let's see who's got the correct answers. So Aishwarya K is still in top, followed by Gitanjali, Chandana, Dr. Deepali, and SK. We've got seven more questions to go. So please do continue answering. So this is a typical uh, granuloma analog. You see this palisading pattern. You see this degenerate collagen around which these histiocytes are palisading, okay? So this typical pattern where you're seeing degenerate collagen with histiocytes and giant cells. Degenerate collagen, can you make out the collagen here? It's slightly swollen. Degenerate collagen. Degenerate collagen with surrounding histiocytes. Some of them are giant cells. And this it's appearing slightly blue in color as well, which is because of mucin within the granuloma. This is typical of granuloma annulare. Okay, so we've got another question, I think. Uh, oh, uh, probably not, let me just see. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, that's it. So palisading granulomas are of two types. Um, so we come to the types of granulomas. This is a palisading granuloma. It's either blue granuloma or red granuloma. The different types actually, but uh, these are the prototypes, granuloma annulare, necrobius lipodica, which is a red granuloma. Then we're moving on to the fourth type of granuloma, which is a separative granuloma. Now, separative granuloma are usually infective, okay? Though there are some non-infective variants. Now, the two different types of separative granulomas, one is a truly separative granuloma, a mixed or a mycotic granuloma, where there's a mixture of histiocytes, giant cells, and neutrophils, okay? So this is typically seen in deep mycoses, leishmaniasis, atypical mycobacteria, and warty lupus. Then you have a primarily separative granuloma with, with neutrophilic microabscesses, but very uh, few in the form of uh, very few lymphocytes or histiocytes, uh, poorly formed granulomata. 
So this is usually seen in orificial TB, primary canker, miliary TB, Majoshi's granuloma, etc. So this is an example of it. Okay, this is actually a case of miliary TB, not mine, but from uh, I think this is from McKee's book or Eden's book. You see a nice neutrophilic abscess, but you're seeing a surrounding. Uh, you know, some of them are histiocytes surrounding the neutrophilic microapsis here. Question 14. Which of the following is not an example of a lichenoid and granulomatous pattern? So we're now moving to a mixture of patterns. A mixture of patterns can be seen in a number of diseases. Which of the following is not an example? I've not discussed this, but if you know the answer, you're going to get brownie points for this. But you can make a diagnosis based on exclusion. And the options are TBC, Romatoid nodule, lichenoid purpura, and Hansen's. I'm going to move on to the quiz swiftly. It is not an example. So, the only one answer you have, it should not be an example of lichenoid and granulomatous. So 24 got it right. It is rheumatoid. Sorry, 22 got it right. Actually, it's rheumatoid nodule. Lichenoid purpura has a lichenoid and granulomatous pattern. Right, lichenoid purpura can have it. Rheumatoid nodule does not have it at all. Lichenoid purpura can have a granulomatous pattern. You have a granulomatous variant of lichenoid purpura or capillaritis, right? Tuberculosis varicosis cutis often has a lichenoid and granulomatous pattern. Hansen's also, especially tuberculoid variant, can have lichenoid infiltrates. Let's see who got the answer correct. So it's Aishwarya still in top, followed by Chandana, Dr. Dipali, and SK and Atreya. Okay. So, um, like when, so we've more moved on now to the last pattern, uh, which is um, vasculopathic pattern. So vasculopathic pattern implies pathological changes in the cutaneous vessels. So what do these imply? Oh, we've we got question number 15 to start, actually, though. So diagnosis of vasculitis, so this is testing your basic, basic background knowledge, cannot be made in the absence of, okay? Diagnosis of vasculitis cannot be made in the absence of A, extravasate RBC, two, leukocytoclasis, three, fibrinoid vessel wall necrosis, four, intramural neutrophilic inflammatory infiltrate, which is most important to make a diagnosis of vasculitis, okay? So your question starts now. Five more questions to go after this. Hopefully, we'll finish the group. It's most important to make a diagnosis. So, fibrinoid vessel wall necrosis is the primary factor, primary, you know, cardinal sign that we need to make a diagnosis of vasculitis. Extravasate IBC may or may not be seen. Extravasate IBC, remember, can be seen acute inflammation of any description, even psoriasis in the acute stage, you may see extravasate IBC, okay? Leukocytoclasis obviously is only seen in uh, leukocytoclastic vasculitis, but it may not be seen also, so it's not important. But the fibrinoid vessel wall necrosis is important. Intramural infiltrates are important. You may, you will want to see them, but in small vessel vasculitis, the vessel wall is so thin that you may not see intramural lymphocytic in, uh, inflammatory infiltrates. So that is not a criteria that is essential. Let's look at the leaderboard. Uh, Dr. Dipali is now on top, followed by Akrayo, Aishwarya, Chandana, and DJ. Now, DJ, you might want to change your name if possible because we won't know you if you are going to win the quiz. So histological criteria for diagnosis of vasculitis, evidence of vascular damage should be there. And the evidence of vascular damage includes vessel wall, endothelial cell necrosis, or fibrinoid change. Intramural inflammatory infiltrates um, you know, may or may not be present. But if you're very strict with your criteria, sensitive, sensitivity is gross, you often have to look at other features as well. I told you extravasate IBCs are non-specific. Endothelial swelling may be present, though it's non-specific. Nuclear dust, intraluminal thrombosis, often present in septic disorders, septic vasculitis, um, can be present in uh, you know um, DIC, etc. Intramural intraluminal thrombosis, but is not essential. Perivenular interstitial fibrin deposition is uh, again depends on the chronicity of lesions. Tissue necrosis depends on how acute and severe the vasculitis is. 
base membrane reduplication thickening may or may not be present eosinophils depending on uh, the etiology. So this is a typical example, extra vaseated IVC, fibrinoid vessel wall necrosis. You're seeing these pink structures. These are vessel walls which have been completely destroyed. And here the vessel walls are a bit, vessels are a bit bigger. Uh, these are still small vessels, okay? This is leukocytoclastic vasculitis, lots of neutrophils. Higher power, small vessel. These are, these are going on to medium vessels. This is showing a different case, actually. These are slightly more medium vessels because they're thicker, you can see that. Here, within the medium vessels, you may see intramural infiltrates, okay? So in the medium vessels, you see intramural infiltrates, lymphocytes, neutrophils, nuclear dust. This is called nuclear dust, okay? So, and some fibrinoid vessel wall necrosis seen here. And this is, oops, this is a larger vessel. This is a medium vessel, much more medium vessel. This is in the fat, actually. You're seeing a bigger, thicker cell, fibrinoid vessel wall necrosis, intramural lymphocytes. So if you're looking at large vessel vasculitis, it is very important to identify intramural infiltrates. Without that, we often don't make the diagnosis. In small vessel vasculitis, because the vessel wall is so thin, you're not going to see, even see the vessel wall. It's already damaged. There's no, not going to be intramural. Intramural means within the vessel wall. You're not going to see intra, intramural inflammation in small vessels. Okay, I'm not going to go into the details, but I cannot discuss, finish discussing vasculitis without discussing also paniculitis. Now, paniculitis is classified as septal and lobular. We know this very well. Inflammation within the septa or within the lobules as in here. But often it's not always black and white. It's often mixed. And therefore, we discuss whether the inflammation is mostly septal or mostly lobular. This is a typical example of erythema nodosum where there's septal thickening, some amount of septal inflammation. But you see the inflammatory cells are spilled out into the lobules, around the periphery of the lobules. So this is predominantly septal erythema nodosum. This is predominantly lobular. You see the center of the lobule is also affected. That is predominantly affected. This is predominantly lobular or erythema injuriatum. Question number 16 now. Which of the following is not an example of septal paniculitis? Now you need to know some basics for this. Erythema nodosum, erythema nodosum leprosum, morphia-associated paniculitis, or nephrogenic systemic fibrosing dermatopathy associated paniculitis, not an example of septal paniculitis. Okay. So let's go to Kahoot, which is not an example of septal paniculitis. <laughs> So, uh, 29 of you, however, only got it right. So that is the right answer. ENL is a lobular panicleitis, though it's a misnomer. It's, it's called erythema nodosum, but once you add leprosum, it becomes septal, it goes to lobular. I don't know why it's called, I think clinically because it resembles erythema nodosum, but histologically it resembles a lobular paniculitis. The rest of them are actually septal paniculitis, okay? Even uh, nephrogenic systemic fibrosing uh, dermopathy is a septal paniculitis. Let's see where you are in the leaderboard. Lots of people have dropped down. So Atreyo is now on the top, well done, followed by DJ. DJ, you got to, you're not getting your prize unless at least you mention your name in the chat box later. If you win the quiz, Dr. Dipali, SK and Kalini. All right. So um, now how is the pathogenesis different between septal and lobular? Now we all know that the lobules are, uh, are supplied by an artery. Now if the artery is affected, if it's an arteritis, what is first affected is the center of the lobule. So <coughs> lobular paniculitis is often associated with a septal arteritis. So erythema injuriatum, also called nodular vasculitis, is often associated with a vasculitis in the septa. Okay, so when vasculitis occurs in the septal arteries, you have a lobular paniculitis. So you often see inflammation in septa as well. If you catch the artery there that is inflamed, you will also see some septal inflammation in erythema induratum. But these are overlapping entities, so I don't want to stress too much on it. But I'm only here to discuss the pathology. If the um, inflammation affects the venules and the tiny capillaries. What you see then is a septal paniculitis because these are predominantly along the septa. Okay, so that's a basic difference in pathology. So in the evaluation of paniculitis, we, we decide whether it's septal or lobular and whether there is dermal involvement, which gives us a clue, and whether there is vasculitis or not. 
So septal dominant vasculitis includes leukocytoclastic vasculitis. That's why I'm discussing panicleitis. You see a septal dominant panicleitis, thrombophlebitis, and erythema nodosum. Often you see a venulitis. In lobular dominant, PAN, nodular vasculitis, Bechet's can also be septal dominant, by the way, sometimes, and ENN. I've mentioned this earlier. So dermal involvement, if present, is an important clue because often you have pseudopanicleitis or secondary panicleitis in dermal in inflammatory disorders. These include lipodermatosclerosis, aminostasis, necrobiasis lipoidica, GA, lupus profundus, et cetera, and vasculitis as well. You see a secondary panicleitis. Question 17. Now we finished with the pattern reactions. We've got four questions which we're quickly going to bust through. These are just questions, no more lecture now. We, this is just questions based on the patterns we discussed. So what is a diagnosis? You've got psoriasis, eczema, lichen planus, or none of the above. And here's your histological picture. I'll give you 10 seconds to look at the picture. Psoriasis, eczema, lichen planus, or none of the above. So lecture is over. Just three questions to go through, and then we'll be done. Okay. So we'll now move on to the quiz because it's a spotter, this particular question, and it's brushing up on what we've discussed. I'm glad 13 of you have chosen none of the above, which is the correct answer. I've asked for the diagnosis, not the reaction pattern. The reaction pattern, if I've asked for it, is actually eczematous. It's not uh, psoriasis, which most of you have chosen. This is an eczematous pattern, though it is psoriasiform elongation retiriges. This is eczema, this is scabies. This is scabies mite. So don't go for uh, the diagnosis based on the pattern reaction alone. Look at the other ancillary features. That is the take home message from this particular slide. And that is the reason I put this slide here. These are scabetic mites in the stratum corneum. This is a diagnosis scabies, and therefore the diagnosis is none of the above. It's neither psoriasis nor eczema nor lichen planus. Let's see how, if you, how many of you have got it right. Atre, you're excellent for getting it right. Savera Gupta, who is the winner of the last quiz, I think, is now in second position. Excellent. Well done. Gitanjali, DJ, and Dr. Dipali. Excellent. Now let's move on to the next question. Question 18. Least probable diagnosis. Again, look at the options here. You've got psoriasis, tenia corporis, pityriasis lichenoides chronica, and hyperkeratotic acral eczema. So it's a single slide I'm going to show you. So I'm asking for the least probable diagnosis. That is the slide. Least probable diagnosis. Okay. I'll give you 10 seconds to look at the slide properly. Least probable diagnosis. Okay, so you have to make a diagnosis based on reaction pattern, least probable diagnosis, is what I'm looking at. And the question is coming up. The answer is pityriasis lichenoides chronica because it is not, this particular slide I showed you is not an interface dermatosis showing a psoriasiform pattern of inflammation. Psoriasiform pattern of inflammation can be seen in hyperkeratotic actor eczema, tenia, and psoriasis. Okay. Why is it? Uh, so this is a typical psoriasiform pattern. Elongation of retigages, you don't see this in pityriasis lichenoides chronica, which is an interface dermatosis. Here you see the nice base frame membrane. The basin, basal layer is completely intact, okay? Some focal uh, inflammation may be seen here, but it is irrelevant. You're seeing, looking at the predominant pattern. Paracaritosis, focal hypergranulosis, okay? Capillaries are along uh, slightly, you know, prominent capillaries here, that's a capillary. And uh, papillary dermal infiltrate. There's not seeing, you're not seeing subcornate neutrophils, but whenever you're seeing paracaritosis and psoriasiform pattern, you need to think of all the other differentials I mentioned in the, uh, quiz here. PLC is the only exclusion because it's here it's not interface dermatitis. 
So Vera Gupta is back on the back at the top now, followed by SK, Kalimi, Dr. Dipali, and Atreyu. Okay. All of you are still on uh, very much on the top though, because you've only got a difference of hardly a few hundred points here and there. So you can still make it up. And we've got uh, two more questions to go. Question 19. Which reaction pattern is the best fit? Now, this is, I think, an easy answer. Vesiculobullus, lichenoid, spongiotic, or serraziform. Which reaction pattern is the best fit? Vesiculobullus, lichenoid, serraziform, or spongiotic? That's the slide here. We've got one last question to go after this. Okay, let's move on because we are short of time. Twenty one of you have got it right. This is a vesiculobullous disorder. This is basically a subepidermal bulla with neutrophils. Okay, this is an example of dermatitis herpetiformis actually. This is subepidermal. Can you see here? This is the papillary dermis, edema of papillary dermis with some neutrophils. This is subepidermal bulla. So this is uh, this is not intraepidermal. Okay. So this is not uh, and neither is lichenoid nor spongiotic nor serraziform. Let's see who got the answer right. Savera Gupta is still on top, followed by SK, who is not getting the prize if you are winning it because you are not putting your full name. Dr. Dipali, Gitanjali, and DJ. Okay. So last question, question number 20, decider. Best of luck to all of you. Which pattern reaction is the best fit? Lichenoid, spongiotic, serraziform, or none of the above? Okay. So it may or may not be a trick question. Lichenoid, spongiotic, serraziform, or none of the above? Lichenoid, spongiotic, serraziform, or none of the above? Okay. If you know, the, you can make a diagnosis based on the picture. And if you know the diagnosis, you know which chapter this comes under. Slightly a trick question, but it is easy enough to make a diagnosis. Okay. So I've already discussed this slide actually in the previous lecture. So I'm going to move on to question 20 or 22. Excellent. So 31 of you got it right. This is spongiotic dermatitis. This I've already discussed in the previous lecture, I'm sure. Identify the site. If you identify the site, you know that this is acral skin, quite thick skin, marked hyper uh, keratosis, and uh, in a basket weave uh, pattern, actually, you can see here, you see this eccrine gland going through. You don't see this anywhere else apart from the acral areas. And you see marked spongiosis with vesiculation inside. Just because there's spongiotic vesicles, you don't call this a vesiculobullous disorder, though you can discuss it under that chapter also. This is pomphilic eczema. Okay. So this is an eczematous disorder. Where there is so much ex uh, ex uh, spongiosis, it leads to intraepidermal vesiculation. Okay, so uh, with the end, with this, we have come to the end of the quiz. Uh, we've got a poll actually. Uh, please rate the session out of hundred, and uh, please give feel free to give. What marks? Yes, so I will Thank you very much for your feedback. Well, I'll certainly take this on board and uh, uh, please write in your comments so that I can uh, improve the quiz or the lecture in further uh, sessions. So again, I, uh, for anybody interested in dermatopathology, you've got a WhatsApp teaching group and feel free to message me on this number. That's my personal mobile number. Uh, please don't uh, ask people to, uh, you know, uh, if, uh, I'll, I'll be sharing the WhatsApp uh, link to join if you message me. 
but uh, yeah anybody who wants to join please please do uh, message me directly that's my personal number don't share it with anyone else but you can certainly message me so let's see who's on the leaderboard now at three is Dipanji S yes, with 12,000 marks at number two is Dr. Dipali with 12,691 the top is with 13,000 points is again Dr. Sadeha with the Royal Bank uh, so, uh, DJ and SMA are really uh, uh, well contested quiz. Thank you very much for uh, participating. I hope you enjoy uh, the quiz. And uh, yeah, as uh, discussed earlier at the beginning of the lecture, we'll be posting out, um, you know, um, uh, there's a book. Uh, we've not posted out the first quiz yet, but we'll be doing it. And uh, there are two books actually, and a free registration to the Dermatopathology Pathology Society of India annual conference. I stopped sharing my screen, and uh, I'd like to thank the academy and uh, you see for giving me this opportunity to you know deliver this lecture. And um, thank you very much. Uh, over to a um, lot of our people, I think, as well, who will uh, um, be finishing the session. Thank you very much. Sir, Dr. Galigupa, sir, are you still there? Dr. Venkat, for your effort. Fully there with you. Ching. Hello? Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much, Dr. Efforts and it was really, you know, very interesting and uh, very. I hope all the delegates must have, you know, liked it. And uh, in fact, they they'll they'll a field also. Dermatologist again to you and the Glowderma for their you know, initiative and efforts. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, if you have any further questions, you can certainly uh, message me directly on WhatsApp. Uh, give me your number, so I'll be happy to answer them individually. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night.